Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on the Conscious Re Resistance Network um, and Conscious Resistance YouTube channel. So today we have Mason Moore, who is an anarchist rapper from Oklahoma. And he's been putting out a few um, liberty-minded uh, um, rapping, uh, rapping albums. Uh, lately, and he's getting more into the, uh, you know, anarcho-capitalist um, slant. So, uh, so we can always use more, you know, um, liberty-minded uh, musicians. <laughs> so, uh, so Mason, tell us a little bit about how you got into anarchy, and you know, how you got into rapping. I guess. <laughs> sure. Well, thanks for having me on, Danny. I appreciate it a lot. That's cool. Um, it all started probably like a lot of people like back in 07 if we're doing Ron Powell's first campaign. When I was like just turned 18 and I was interested in politics and stuff. And uh, I was watching the debates and I was assuming that I was going to be supporting a Democrat because, you know, I'd spent my, you know, all my teenage years during the Bush era where, you know, I thought Republicans were pro-war and the other side wasn't. And I remember I watched a Republican debate. I wasn't even sure why I did it. And, and but there's this crazy old guy in the corner that just kept, every time they let him talk, which they didn't very much, he was just spitting his truth. And I was like, damn, this guy's talking some shit right now. Can I cuss? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and afterward, I, I got on Wikipedia or whatever and looked him up immediately, and I saw that he ran as a libertarian in 1988. So I automatically went to libertarian and found out what that was about. And, um, you know, and. But you know what happened from there. I just learned more and more about the message. I read all I could about it. Um, supported his campaign a lot. Um, tried to spread the message. And as time went on, you know, uh, the 2008 campaign happened in 2012. And probably leading into the 2012, I was familiar with, uh, you know, taking the next step of the progression of the, you know, the thought process of um, liberty and Austrian economics and all that and, t and taking it into you know, anarcho-capitalism, which is the logical conclusion, I think. Um, and and I, re I remember the moment that I decided, that I actually, that actually hit me, it was like, duh, this is like, anarchism is the solution, it's it's the final product of the thought, was I was watching uh, a Kokesh's show, he had Stefan Manu and Jeffrey Tucker on, and we were talking about IP rights, and, and growing up in the 2000s, uh, everybody was kind of familiar with you know with Napster and the idea of IP rights and how and and through 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 that they're looking at it through lens of music and, and the entertainment industry and uh they and they were just talking about how the government enforcing IP rights restricts you know invention and, and how nobody can own an idea and these are all stuff that I already heard about but talking about it through the through the perspective of of anarchy and at that, that moment everything just came together and I was like oh duh this makes sense. And I think with the words Jeffrey Tucker said that that really turned over. It was like, it was like we don't want the government to do anything. Anything we do is awful. And the most important things we have are our courts and and you know security. Like those are the two most important things. So why would we leave the government in charge of them? It just doesn't make any sense. So that was the moment I decided to the anarchist. It was probably in 2012. But yeah. So so what um, what books have uh, you know influenced you the most? Uh, uh, the first books I read were, you know, Ron Paul stuff, and uh, in 2007, uh, in his campaign in 07, uh, when he made, uh, Peter Schiff his, his economic campaign, uh, so I read Schiff's name, and I read him, read all his stuff, and, and then obviously I made the advance of reading about Rothbard, reading Rothbard, and, and all that, um, yeah. I got a, um, you said book. I have one book on right here that I've been reading. Um, well, I've, everybody's probably read it, but it's like in reverse. How to, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And I think that's an awesome book for, for any anarchist or anyone that wants to spread the ideas of, of liberty. Because, um, like, if we want to make the world a better place, we have to share these ideas. We can't just talk to each other all the time. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, uh, that's really what, what, I'm, what I try to do. So, so, so how long you been you've been rapping? Oh, oh, forever. Uh, 
I was I was doing it and all the way through high school and all that. And I, I started to get serious at twenty one. I was like, oh, I'm gonna give rap a shot. All my music was not li- is is not liberty themed. I mean, obviously it comes through in most stuff. Yeah, when I was about twenty one, I, I I decided to uh, you know go for it and I recorded a whole lot of music. I continued to do it for a few years and, and I, I I slowed down quite a bit. Last time. But the, the last two songs that I put out were a song called Ancap Rat. Um, it's on YouTube, and, and I'll share all my links to my stuff with you a little later. Uh, or you can find me on Twitter at Mamo N one L. It's M A M O N one L H. Mamo is kind of my other name I use. And uh, my, all my links to all my social media and my SoundCloud are there, and you can, and you can go and listen and download all my stuff. Um, but Ancap Rap, and, and I got a really good, really good um, feedback from people from that. So um, when Luna hit me up. Uh, a couple months ago or whatever and, and we made we made that track and and that we got an awesome feedback from that and he did an awesome job with the video and it's, yeah yeah so, so i'm going to focus on that for a while because he was to like it so i'm going to keep doing it mm-hmm. you mean you mean liberty-minded yeah. rapping yeah. right absolutely yeah 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 definitely i think that um you know the time is ripe for that kind of uh, you know music i think the people are receptive to it Right, I think people want something different, right? So um, you gotta you gotta strike when uh, the moment is right, right? When the opportunity presents itself. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, I, I mean, I just do it because it's fun, and people seem to like it, and and it, and it, I, it gives me the opportunity. Like I'm here because I made rap music, and I love to talk about liberty, and and it's created this opportunity. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep doing it. So so um, as a rapper, um, I guess as a musician in general. Um, I, I talk a lot about intellect, intellectual property, you know, yeah. with people because because some people they get uh, you know caught up in that. Like you know, how can you be a rapper and or you know any kind of musician and not have IP and not you know force people to buy your stuff and how can you offer it for free? You know, so how, what do you say to those people? Uh, well, that uh, that argument is completely ridiculous to start with. Because as a musician, you want as many people to be exposed to your music as possible. If you're making good music, if you're making good music, and you want people to hear it, then more people like you, and let's tell other people about it, and you want them to share. The best, whenever I have this argument with people, the best example I give is when Lil when Lil Wayne became extremely popular in like the 05, 06, 07, like when his rise to like being the the incredible superstar he became. It was because he made these mixtapes and they were free to download off the internet, and that's and everybody shared them and everything. And there was, and he, half the time he was rapping over other people's beats, and and that's what what made his music spread, and that's what made him grow to be number one. Um, and as far as like how do you make money off it, and, and where's the motivation to be a creator? I mean, um, it, it you make money other ways. Yeah, uh, you make money from performing. Number one. Or if you become big, you brand yourself and, and you use yourself to, you know, sell other products, sell sell real property, not, you know, intellectual property is kind of oxymoronic because it's it's not property. It's not, if it's if it's not a scarce resource, it's not property. It's it's you know it's infinitely rep, rep, replicatable. Nice, yeah, yeah, and also like, how can you um, you know patent an idea or you know like a form? Like, can you patent a square or a rectangle or a triangle? <laughs> yeah, who else yeah. the patent for the wheel? Like, like yeah. everything has wheels in it. Like, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous. All technology is built upon older technology. Yeah, yeah. And and the the argument that nobody has the motivation to create if they if they can't own with their creation, it's it, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, 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 for example, like movies, like 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 the companies that make movies, like you know, big entertainment industry. Uh, they're perfectly capable of protecting their movies and having them not leak. Like now, movies don't even get online from while they're in theaters for a couple of weeks on, on the pirate bay or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, they they are really good at keeping secrets, basically. Um, and that's that, that, that's how creators have to do it. They, have, they just have to keep secrets. And obviously, there's a lot of structure in place that makes it hard for people to comprehend this a change happening. Like and it's not going to happen overnight. You have to roll back the laws slowly, mm-hmm. but but um, yeah, it's 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 completely. I mean, it, it, it's crony capitalism in its best. It's just people in power. They're trying to accumulate more wealth, and 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 they they're the ones that created these laws to protect themselves. You know, allow these to create create all this stuff that protects them. And that's it. 
Yeah. And when it comes to intellectual property debate, something interesting that happened recently was um, uh, Taylor Swift took her music off Spotify, off the streaming stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's lots of different arguments either way. But, but um, Taylor Swift is okay to do that because everyone knows who Taylor Swift is already. There's not a web that big of an audience she could still reach out to that she hasn't already. Um, so, so she, it's cool for her to do that. Like, whatever. Um, but uh, that's not going to work for 99.999% uh, of other artists. Like, that model wouldn't work. They want their music streamed. They want as many people to hear, hear their stuff as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I remember uh, hearing about a story about, you know, you know Monty Python, those, um, you know, the British comedian uh, yes. group? They, yeah. uh, they, um, you know, they they have their old movies, right? And so and so, uh, I guess people were were starting to upload some of their, you know, the content onto YouTube, and then YouTube kept like um, deleting. I guess some people would flag it, you know, as copyright violation, and then they would delete it, right? And then finally, you know, they stopped. People stopped flagging it, and uh, and then they just allowed people to upload, you know, these uh, segments. And so what ended up happening was the younger people that didn't grow up with uh, with Monty Python, never heard of them, actually became interested and and so, you know, and then, and then after they became, you know, their their sales went up, yeah. skyrocketed because <laughs> because they found out about Monty Python <laughs> through yeah, YouTube, absolutely. right? <laughs> and that, yeah, and that never would have happened if people didn't share it. Yeah. And that, and that, that's just an example of what, I mean, at the root of all this, the, the whole reason we even, the, the message of liberty has spread this much and that entertainment is, has become this is because um, of the internet, just as a whole, because people have this ability to communicate with each other. And then, you know, about 20 years ago, that, you know, music and, and video were not thought of a, of a non-scarce resource, you know, it was something you had to have. And, and it's just a beautiful thing that technology is, is creating this, and this, this world that we live in, this environment where, where uh, information can be spread so, so, so easily. Yeah, and, and also intellectual property, the way I look at it is um, it's like you're living in the past. You know, it's like, it's like you, you have one, one, one song, right? And it's like a hit, and so you, you, know, you quickly patent it or whatever, or copyright it, and then, and then anybody else who tries to play it without giving you a royalty, you track them down, each and every person, <laughs> and, and you, you know, prosecute them, and you get whatever money you can out of them at the expense of future creativity, right? Because time is a scarce resource, right? We all have limited amounts of time. So when you devote that time to to the past, you're sacrificing the future. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's kind of the way I look at it. So yeah, that's yeah, that's an interesting. Yeah, absolutely. It's like it's like those uh, you know those one hit wonders that that you find, <laughs> you know, yeah. right? Yeah. The complete manufactured by by the entertainment industry complex that you know just through marketing that that made the stuff popular and the people that write the music and they you know all that stuff yeah, yeah. and they just try to hold on and they just try to make the money off them every penny they can absolutely yeah like there's a there's a rapper I remember um uh like a, when was that like maybe like close to ten years ago I guess Mike Jones are you familiar with him who Mike Jones yeah there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That, would, you, would you say that's an example of a one-hit wonder? Because that guy... Uh, yeah, he had quite a bit of underground buzz, I think. Okay, because because that's basically... That was basically his biggest his biggest song, right? That one and... The one about, <laughs> that one and the one about the teeth, his grill or something, right? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah. I, don't know. I, I think it was with Paul Wall and all that. I mean, Paul Wall makes the grills and all that. Oh, so. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's when my brother started introducing me to more rap. He, you know, he, he said, "Check out yeah. this guy." <laughs> yeah. So, so what other rap are you are you into? Are you into like are there any mainstream artists that? Well, well, well I'm not. I, I wouldn't really say like um, I'm into like I like I uh, you know um, learn about the different rappers. I basically yeah. the rappers that I know of is because of my brother, right? My my 22 yeah. year old brother. He's uh, he's big into rap. He knows all about it. You know, he he's. He, you know, he did, he knows a lot more than me, so he basically educates me, and uh, the stuff that I, I like is only because he's played it so many times that I can't help but like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the way I am, you know. If uh, if something is played long enough around me, I'm gonna end up liking it. That's it's just an annoying thing, you know. So, <laughs> sure. yeah. I, tr I try to I try to uh, separate myself and isolate myself 
as much as possible because I just sometimes I just don't want to hear it's just too much like I, I want to focus on other things <laughs> I don't know that's just the way I am <clears throat> yeah but 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 let me but tell me about your uh, your family like how do they respond to uh, you know to your rapping and to your you know liberty uh, you know philosophy uh, yeah uh, I mean those they were always like mostly politi politically apathetic as a whole as a for the most part and um i mean they're, they're just pr pretty neutral about it they were really supportive of rapping and all that and when i was a kid and all that i mean it was just the music i was around growing up i grew up in a like a, a rural like farm town that was that was and i went to went to school at a really small school but it's really super culturally diverse um and I don't know. Rap music was just the music that was that was around, so that's why why I was became a rapper. And then, like my and my path towards anarchy, um, I mean, it was all based in logical ideas that are pretty easy to digest if you do them slowly. So when they hear me talk about this stuff, like they kind of get it, and they're pretty apathetic as a whole. But then like, nobody really objects to my to to when I talk about it. And when I talk about things, I always try to focus on. Uh, Individual issues more than just general things. Now, that's why I, I, I like to use the word liberty rather than anarchist when I can. And titles like get people confused, and, and anarcho capitalism is uh, like anarchy and capitalism are two words that people hear and are like, ah, that's, that's bad, you know. It's just that's just the ideas ingrained in people's, in people's thinking. So, I, I mean, I try to focus, focus on ideas. I'm not really interested in arguing with people. I'm more interested in, in trying to assist them in, the, in, in you know, believing in liberty and in, in understanding, in understanding the ideas. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether I'm talking to a progressive or I'm talking to a mainstream Republican or I'm talking to a libertarian. It's, it's, uh, there's plenty of common ground with everyone for, for anarchy. There's yeah. plenty of common ground. And that's how I try to talk to people. It's pretty easy. So, um, so yeah. so do you try to engage like as many people as you can around like wherever you are you go to the you know the grocery store the bank or, you know wherever you yeah, are yeah it's, de it's definitely what i like to talk about so i try to talk to you about it whenever i can um now, and now it's usually just through the lens of of the whatever it, whatever the issue of the day is you know right now it's you know the most relation of police or or you know police brutality or whatever but the real cause is the war on drugs like that's that's kind of the root cause um and now, and now this is just a product, and 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 when you explain to people that, like that, um, the mo most people get it. Like like the the video of Eric Garner getting choked and fucking getting killed. Like who? Nobody think that's all. Think that's thinks that's all right. The really super vocal like minority think it's okay. Mm -hmm. Most people are like this is nonsense. There is some horrible shit going on. Um, yeah, and I just and then when I have to explain to people, I just say, look, it's caused the war on drugs. See, I read an article the other day that sixty-two percent or something like that of of arrests police make are for nonviolent criminals, the vast majority of which are drug related, and uh, it's it's completely nonsense to arrest someone for doing something they want to do to themselves. But beyond that, the the cops or the people enforcing the laws are actually the root cause of most of the violence there is too because all drug-related violence is, is because of prohibition. We learned a long time ago prohibition doesn't work. That's what created the, you know, the, the, the crime kingpins to start with. And, and this is just the continuation of that. Drug, like uh, gang violence and all that is just a product of the war on drugs. And, and like, there would be no drug kingpins if cops weren't enforcing these laws. It's like the, the, the war on drugs led to police profiteering, which has led to militarization of police. And it's just like it's a racket, just like being a drug kingpin is a racket, and both sides need each other to keep each other going. It's a perpetual cycle of just disgusting, but just, just a disgusting thing that doesn't work, and we can clearly see it doesn't work. Um, and when I say that, people are like, oh, well, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, you're right. We have a perfect, uh, near, you know, a near perfect example of how prohibition is a complete failure. But, but I think that that kind of um, gives politicians the, uh, the, um, hey, say the, the benefit of being ignorant or stupid, which, which I don't really think that they are. I, I don't think that they're ignorant. I think they know exactly what they're doing, and and so from that respect, 
the drug war is a massive success, <laughs> right? It's doing exactly what they want it to do. And, um, and you know, the police, um, you know, brutality is just a, it's just a natural progression. It's, 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 the, uh, it's a natural appendage to that, uh, you know, that failed action. So, um, you know, of course, they have to tell the people that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, what's going on. You know, we need more police. We need more riot gear. We need more, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? The M mine resistant tank yeah. vehicles, you know, uh -huh. on, on the streets. <laughs> because uh, marijuana is just so dangerous, you know. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and, and, and actually, um, you know, I was just talking to my brother recently because, um, you know, talking about how, how much of a of a business of a you know a, of a successful business a person can make through like for example not even becoming a, a you know a, let's say a weed dealer but even just selling like untaxed cigarettes like like what the guy uh, you know Eric Garner was basically killed for over right untaxed cigarettes and yeah like, that's a black market like there has become a, or a gray market or whatever it, it's become, it's become an illegal marketplace that that's worth doing because it's so profitable. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, definitely. Like, and, and how, um, you know, my brother was telling me, you know, how it works basically is, is that in New York, which is the highest, basically, the, I think the state that, that has the highest tax on, on cigarettes, and even higher in, in New York City. So that's where the black market especially flourishes. And so, you know, what people do, they go down to Virginia where, in, you know, it's like um, $4 a pack, and they come back up here where it's like $10 a pack. And they sell it, and they make you know massive profits, and people can make like six figures just by doing that, <laughs> you know. And uh, <coughs> yeah, something like that. That's what I've heard. Like, it, like you can really be if, you, if you're, I guess, if you're efficient, uh, you can be pretty, pretty profitable. Um, and uh, and that's just it's just a natural it's a natural progression of you know the state trying to discourage people from doing something that is maybe just a vice. You know, that's <laughs> it's one thing Lysander Spooner teaches, right? Vices are not crimes, right? Uh, and that's, that's, that's what I try to t tell people also. You know, people get this idea so confused, right? You know, but they're drug dealers. They're weed dealers. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, you're like, yeah, and yeah. what's wrong with it? <laughs> you don't like <laughs> it? Go, go ahead. I mean, it's not drugs and, and guns and, um, even prostitution, all the all these things that people aren't crazy about in society that, that you know there's laws against and all this. It it's it's the thing is like once the technology exists, it's never going to not exist. And and if you try to make it not exist, it creates a black market which is going to create violence to enforce, you know, rules of the market to enforce contracts, basically. Um, and that that's always gonna happen. It doesn't matter whether whether it's prostitution or drugs or guns or I mean, even to even abortion to some extent. I don't know what the real. I mean, I I, I know the moral solution that, that abortion is is not not good, but I don't think it can be illegal. Like you just have to change people's minds about it. Because even if it's illegal, it's still going to happen. Um, and and it's a matter of altering people's people's minds about it. But once the technology exists, it exists, and there's nothing, not any government, any power structure, anything can do to stop it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Talking about you know three D printers and printing guns and things like that. I'm sure that 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 has changed massively. You know, talking about gun control laws that that's really changed the landscape. And uh, and it kind of it kind of reminded me of uh, of Larkin Rose's video. Have you seen the one where um, it's titled uh, uh, "What's So Bad About Nazis"? Have you seen that? No, I <laughs> that was a really great one. And he, and he basically in the video he basically says. You know, he's like, this is a serious question. What is so bad about Nazis? And what is so different from the Nazis comparing them to the federal government as it is today, right? And the very first thing most people would say is, well, they killed millions of people, right? Okay. So, so, so let's see. The Native, Native American genocide, <laughs> right? Police brutality. How many people die? It was like... Like you're like eight times more likely to die from a from a, a police officer than you are from a terrorist, <laughs> right? It's I think like, it's higher than that, isn't it? Is it higher? I don't even. That's the last. That's the last <laughs> I checked. But <laughs> you, you, you know, there's there's really nothing at all different. Like what? What is it? The sign? You don't like the sign? Is that is that <laughs> is that what makes them different? Or the military? You know, the the police state? Like what? You know, Hitler would be jealous 
You know, if you if you saw the, surve- yeah. the surveillance state as it is today, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, completely, completely. And and the number of people in prison is just crazy. It's like one percent of the population or something. Yeah, it's, it's insane. Something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it is yeah. more than any any of the worst regimes or monarchs or, or you know dictators in the history of the world. More people are in prison in the United States now than any of those places had. Or, or the United States has more people in prison per capita than yeah. any place. Yeah, and yeah. Small, yeah. awful dictatorships. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like uh, like even in a, in a country like China, you know, which has like around a billion people, you know, we still have more percentage yeah. and absolute number of people in prison <laughs> than <Yeah>. China, <laughs> which is supposed to be like red communist China, you know. Although now they're starting to become more capitalist. <clears throat> but um, but but yeah, I. Uh, you know, I also try to talk as much, as you know as often as I can to people around me about this stuff because there's so many misconceptions that we live with all the time uh, that uh, it's just it's always it's a constant job <laughs> and I like it. <laughs> yeah, you know. Do, do you ever feel like you you you're forced to focus on the negative so often because because it's so glaringly obvious that that the general the the youth the the regular belief that people have about any given topic is always so false. And you feel when you force to say, "No, that's not true." No, that's not true all the time. You're always poking holes and stuff. And you know, do you ever feel like uh, I forced to focus on the negative because I think like this? Um, I mean, I mean, like, um, like my family, for example. Like, <laughs> I get into constant arguments with my my mother, especially. And her primary thing, because, you know, she's all about, you know, green living and, and, you know, solar panels and all this kind of stuff. So her primary thing is, what if there's a company that pollutes, you know, and, you know, destroys the, the water, the soil, the, you know, pollutes the air? What is going to happen to that company if there's no government to, um, you know, to, infor- you know, correct it, its actions or to, you know, regulate it? <laughs> and... To which you know you can say like, well, does that happen today with the government? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> there's, no, there's no government for them to lobby to to make laws that allow them to pollute. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I talk about, uh, and actually, I was just talking to my uh, another one of my relatives, and, and I said, you know, I started talking about there's certain corporations that are you know given um, subsidies and which actually promotes more reckless behavior, right? So when you when you um, when you give a bailout, right, or just or a subsidy or politi- some kind of political favoritism, you're rewarding inefficiency. You're rewarding reckless behavior. So what happens? Are you going to see less reckless behavior or more, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so exactly. that's the incentive, right? And then and then and then and then he's like, no, that doesn't happen. Like, what are you talking about? Let's go down the list: Chevron, Shell, BP, Chase, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America. <laughs> you know, Monsanto. Should I, should I go on? <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's it exactly. Every every major corporation that that's what they do, and that's what they're forced to do because that's what the marketplace requires them to do now. Because if there's even if there's a super honest company that wants to you know be a, be a big bank, and then they want to compete in that field, they can't unless they lobby the government, and and, that, and that's that's the force that that we're against. So we're, like the, what's the common denominator between big evil corporations? Um, and, and and everything else. The common denominator is they're all in bed with the government, and 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 oh, between all big evil corporations and all that, and it's the government. You have to get the government out of the scenario, out of the situation, and the, and the only way to do like uh, the argument, I was, the the jump I made from you know being a, being a libertarian to being an anarchist was was that that the only things the government should be in charge of as a libertarian are security and. Um, settling of disputes or whatever, of course, and, and, and um, you know, you say, well, the government can't do anything, right, and there's, it's, there's plenty of examples and explanations of how the free market can handle, handle those things with, in, in an anarchist environment, um, so, so you just remove them from, from the scenario, and, and the libertarian belief that, you know, a small government would be good, but you're never going to be able to keep it because the government's still there, and this is the nature of it. Whenever there's a monopoly on anything and there's no competition, it's always going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, just like the police state, just like uh, just like the government has for the last 200 years. It started real small, but then it got bigger and bigger and bigger because there's nothing for it to compete against. And, and you know, competition makes things be efficient. Competition makes things uh, progress. You have to advance. You have to be competitive. 
and the government will never do that, and that's just that's just it. Yeah, yeah. They, they're basic yeah. economic rules here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To, yeah, yeah. You know, even if the government is like you know, let's say five percent of what it is today, if it's still a government, then it still has the right. It claims the moral right to rule and to tax its citizens, right? To steal from its citizens. So, so if you yeah. give even uh, even a government that's just five percent of what it is today the ability to steal from its citizens, then it doesn't matter. It it, it, it can, yeah, like you said, it will swell and it will grow to gigantic proportions until it just topples over, right? Because the people can't support a giant welfare and warfare state anymore, any longer, right? It can't be leeching off the the the, the productivity of the industrious any longer. Um, and that's exactly what it does, is it leeches off of the producti productivity of everyone else. It's just like, uh, it's just like if, I mean, if you make a dollar a week and, and somebody takes a penny out of it, and it just goes, and that, that's and, uh, five cents or whatever. And it, it just, I forgot the metaphor I'm trying to, how to explain the metaphor I've used this before. Uh, all, yeah, all it's doing is taking future productivity and future energy that could be used towards advancing further and making people's individual lives better in the most efficient way possible and just using it in random ways that, that don't make sense. The, the invisible hand really works, and it's just people doing whatever they want to do. And, and that's it. And, and the use of force, the government is nothing more than the use of force. That's it. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, it's funny when people, when people bicker about tax laws, you know, like, you know, saying, you know, we need this tax law, we need to get rid of this one, but keep this one, we need to scale this one down. <laughs> so it's like, it's like, imagine if you, if, like, let's say with, with, with what you say, you have a dollar, right? And I say, okay, I'm going to put a gun to your head and say, give me 10 cents or else I'm going to, you know, imprison you or kill you, right? So you give me 10 cents and you're like, all right, that's not so bad. But then what's to stop me from saying, all right, now give me the whole dollar. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, yeah, because that's, exactly. because that's what a monopoly is. So the idea is not, the, it's not how much we're being taxed. It's the fact that we're being taxed, right? It's the theft. Yeah. It, that's that's the issue. Exactly, exactly. And that that's all all it is. It's it's uh you know it's it's extortion. It's 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 um theft with the threat of being kidnapped if if you don't if you don't concede to being to being having your money taken from you. You're, you're the fruits of your labor taken from you, and, that, and that's all it is. And the other the arguments against it that people come up with, the social contract and all these other things, they they like it, it's a good idea, but but in an anarchist society, like you can live communally, and people will live live communally. There might be communal cities, and yeah, you can live in an environment where everybody gives so much of the fruits of their labor to do this and do that and do that. People are welcome to, to go and live these places and experiment in whatever way, and these things are going to exist. But um, you can't force people to do it. You can't hold, like, if you're born between these two imaginary lines on a map, you're, you're stuck here, you know? And it's, uh, and, they, and they're just going to continue to take, to take your wealth, to, to take the fruits of your labor by force for all time. And, and it's just taking, that's just the way the world is, and it's completely ridiculous. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean it's true. Like um, you know, let's say in a stateless society, you will have different different types of people that want to live differently. Let's say you know some people want to live in a community where they smoke weed, right? Some people want to live in a weed less community, you know, without weed. Some people want to live in a just black community, just white, just Hispanic, whatever, just Christian, <laughs> you know. And as long as it's voluntary, what's the problem, right? People can come and go as they please, you know. What's the problem? And uh, and I think actually that the same can be said for private businesses, right? If somebody wants to have a business catering only to black people or only to white people, only to Hispanic people, right? <laughs> Why can't they do that, right? Why do you need a law forcing businesses to act in one way or another just because, you know, you think it's immoral? Yeah, yeah, that's that's ridiculous to say that your private business is not like your house. To say that you have to let anyone in your house would be completely ridiculous. And, and you, to say that you don't own your business and you have to let anyone in your business is just like saying you have to let anyone in your house. It's completely ridiculous. Yeah. And and I, and obviously the the businesses that are going to succeed the best are the ones that aren't prejudiced, right? Like they're the ones that are the 
the marketplace is going to work, and, pe and you know, and people are welcome to protest the businesses that that are racist or whatever, that are prejudiced. Yeah, they can march on the and do whatever, you know. And as long as it's nonviolent, that's fine. And that discourages people from shopping there even more. And so, like, freedom wins, and treating people good is going to win in the long run. But it, but it can't be done with force. It has to be done naturally. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, actually, uh, you know, talking about protesting, I was uh, I was talking about with my family about the Ferguson, you know, rioting that's been going on recently. And mm -hmm. um, and I was basically I was basically saying how idiotic it is that these uh, that these looters who um, you know have no idea what they're actually protesting for it's, it seems like they're just taking advantage of the uh, of the commotion so that they can you know you know destroy private property steal merchandise you know <laughs> and it's just it, it's so absurd because you know it's so sad that you see these um, these entrepreneurs who are themselves black they come out and they're just like this is like yelling at these idiotic young kids that are stealing their stuff like what the hell are you doing I had nothing to do with this. <laughs> you know, this is my business. I built it up, you know, over many, many years. And you're just destroying it. What the hell are you doing? You're, <laughs> you guys are morons. <laughs> um, and, and, yeah, it's basically saying how, you know, it, it, that's basically what it is. When you have riots and protests and, you know, mass gatherings like that, you, have, you tend to have mobs and violence. It's just, it's, it usually degenerates that way, right? People do not think when they're in a mob scene. <laughs> yeah, right, because there's no individual responsibility in that situation. Like, like it, it kind of group thought kind of takes over in, in many ways. And yeah, it's really unfortunate um, that, that that happened because this is something that, you know, uh, people in the liberty movement fo focused on for a long time was, was the police state and police brutality and this stuff. And, and when, when when this stuff has happened as of recent, and it brings so much to light and gives us an opportunity to inform people about these ideas that we've been talking about for so long, and it gets such a black eye on it because of the looting and the rioting. Like, that, that's the, you know, that's the Fox News narrative, is, is that there's looted, looters and rioters. And the vast majority of people protesting were, were peaceful. Um, but, but it was such an opportunity to spread the message of liberty, and it, it got such a black eye because there's all these shots of buildings burning, and and it, it it's really unfortunate. Yeah. Because that the, the whole right wing, you know, talk the right wing talk radio and and Fox News and all that that's just all they focused on, and that was that was their message. They they skipped over. They don't even talk about the, the police brutality part, and their defense of it is 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 unnecessary now because they they have other reasons why those people are wrong. And yeah. Yeah. Which, which sucks, but this is. But it, um, I mean, I don't want to say that this is a good thing that happened, but uh, it, it, this this has been an awesome opportunity for for people in the liberal movement to talk about police brutality and talk about the war on drugs and talk about these things um, while people are paying attention. And that's what I try to do a lot is 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 talk about the things people are thinking about, um, say in a way that. Um, that that's digestible to them. Like you, I I try to be aware if I'm talking to a liberal, I'll talk I'll talk you know, words that I know that are appealing to them. But I'm still talking about liberty. I just change my message a little. I mean, change the words that I'm using a little bit so it appeals to them. If I'm talking to a conservative, I'll you know I'll talk and more about economics from an economic perspective. Um, and yeah, and that that's 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 that what I take from Ferguson was was. Um, it's really sad what happened, and but the an effort to try to control the narrative to, to, towards something positive is what what we should be trying to do. Yeah, it also reminds me of a, a quote by um, Alexander Haig. I think he's a, he was a Secretary of State. He said, um, "Let them protest and march all they want, as long as they pay their taxes." <laughs> so 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 if if people focus their efforts on going out into the street. And carrying signs and just shouting something, but then afterwards they just go back <laughs> to doing what they were doing before. Yeah. Then uh, what was the uh, wh what did you achieve, right? So so that's and also the other thing is when you protest, it's kind of a dangerous thing, right? You're like attracting police, right? You know, riot police in riot gear, right? You're you're basically attracting violence, and so that's one of the reasons why I kind of discourage people from 
protest. I, I, I don't recommend it. I, it's not my first method of uh, spreading a message, you know. Like in this day and age with, with the internet, there's so many ways to spread a message. Like you're spreading a message with, you know, with, with, with rap, right? You can spread it through YouTube. You can spread it through the Facebook, through, you know, through so many ways. Why are you going to go and put yourself in harm's way? You know, well, for holding up a sign, you know? <laughs> it just doesn't make sense to me anymore. Yeah. Pro protesting and marching today, like the, the Ferguson and, and the the um, Obama, um, the, this is like uh, an outlier, right? There's protests that happen every day, especially in like DC and all around the country. People march and protest all the time, and you never hear about any of it. This is just the one time that it happened to get media attention. And there's, I, I, th I think, to each their own. As long as you, you know, you do what you, you think is best to spread whatever, to spread the message that you want to spread. But um, yeah, there's much more efficient ways of doing it. And but I think everybody just needs to do what's right for them too. So yeah, yeah, quite right, definitely. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, if you really, really want to protest, I mean, go ahead, but understand what you're doing. Like I, I'm sure you've seen those, um, the Adam Kokesh and also Peter Schiff did also uh, some videos where he actually went to some of these protests. Uh, uh, you know, gatherings like you know, like um, Occupy Wall Street, like the Monsanto. I think Christopher, Christopher Cantwell did also, and he's basically just asking them simple questions like, "What is the Federal Reserve? Do you know what a Federal Reserve note is?" <laughs> you know, yeah. and they have no idea what that is. Like, what do you even put? What is capitalism? They can't even answer that question. So, what are you doing out here then? <laughs> yeah, um, people have been talking about the the, the big three recent, you know political uprisings or whatever and it was the Tea Party and it was it was um you know Ferguson uh and it was Occupy Wall Street. And I think Anonymous is actually the fourth too, but it's it's done in a different way. Mm -hmm. And Anonymous is, is it well you know that happened online for the most part. Yeah. Um yeah. Uh, the symbology when it the pro other protests and stuff. But as a whole, like that has progressed to become a very, you know, liberty minded thing, anonymous as a whole. Yeah. For most of the stuff that they do. And that has actually grown and got better as time went on. But these other pro things that started with something good that was something liberty minded, like the Tea Party, like I was at uh, one in two thousand seven, you know? Mm -hmm. And and really it was all about liberty. And now it's just become something awful and disgusting. And Occupy Wall Street was good energy towards, you know, bank Banks and federal government is the problem. But we're focusing on the banks rather than the government, rather than the Federal Reserve, um, which is unfortunate. And, and, and this, the Ferguson thing is turning, focusing more on race. When, well, well, there is definitely a racial outcome to the war on drugs, but the war on drugs is the cause. It's not, like, I don't think cops are intentionally racist, but the, the laws are enforcing or encouraging them to be. Um, and it's in this part, and again, it's just getting diverted and, into uh, the wrong direction, and and that's and this is the group thing. Like people, people just want to chant stuff that doesn't really have any rational logic behind it, and and, and then it dies off because there's really no thought behind it. And that's why I try to spread the message. You spread end the war on drugs. That's not something people are going to forget. People will see that every day. Every day when you pull over when your car gets searched, I've been pulled over in my car searched so many times. <laughs> uh, let's do war on drugs, like. I'm not. Heard, I've I've never been suspected of, of harming anyone, yeah. but I've been suspected yeah. of, of many victimless crimes. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like uh, like when I when I see people, you know, <clears throat> march on Monsanto or the Occupy Wall Street, or you know, protesting Chevron, you know, the oil, uh, you know, uh, destroying the Amazon rainforest in South America, um, you know, these are all horrible companies and corporations. You know, it's true, but but you know, you're just. You, it's like you're just trying to, uh, you know, fight the hydra head, you know, or you're trying to fight a branch, you know. You have to go to the root, right? You're not, you're not going to the root. And if th so many people could just focus their attention on the root, I think it would just be amazing what <laughs> we could achieve. <laughs> yeah, it's it's um, it's it's whack a mole, right? You know, if you destroy Monsanto, another Monsanto is just going to rise up. Mm -hmm. um, you have to destroy what what what's feeding Monsanto. Oh yeah, yeah. What gives it teeth? What what gives it sovereign immunity? You know, to do what it yeah. does with impunity, right? You have the Monsanto Protection Act, which completely um, protects it from any any um, you know litigation from people who claim to be injured by GMO seeds, <laughs> and yeah. and you know that's that's amazing. Like, imagine a small business, you know, any any small business that has no ties to to the government. If they go under, that's it. They go under. They don't get a bailout, <laughs> right? 
Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I'm interested. Well, Wes did ask you this. Um, to what we were talking about earlier. Obviously, the worst part about GMOs is the, is the idea of making living things intellectual property, right? To 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 um to make genes and, and stuff intellectual property. Uh, what what are your thoughts? Do you think this tech this is technology that should not exist? I, I think we can't you can't stop it. I just think you know, um, uh, just like any other technology, it's going to exist, going to continue to exist. But I think um, you know, just the the law is protecting it and defending it, saying and, and it being intellectual property are completely crazy. Yeah, and then they. they I just I just, like wrote, I just I just wrote an article recently called uh, I titled it um, GMOs are to food what Keynesianism is to economics. So, yeah, I checked that out. Yeah, so so what I you know it, it, I mean so so you know being an anarchist right I cannot be for any kind of ban right because that would basically <laughs> just enlarge state power be completely contrary to what I'm striving for as a, as an anarchist so. So, you know, I give all of the power to the free market to decide whether or not they want GMOs. And, and it, just, it just seems to me that, you know, w given all the farm subsidies and protection, protection that these giant corporations get, I, I just don't see something like GMOs persisting and surviving at all, you know. Um, you know, I may be wrong, but th that's just the way I, I, I think will happen. You know, you know. Of course, you know, I don't, I don't advocate any violence happening <laughs> one way or another. I think the people will decide, and uh, and and without a without a um, without a state, uh, we will inevitably have technology that will foster life. You know, that's you know because that's what happens with you know when you when you remove uh, the violence of government, you you automatically have corporations that are environmentally friendly and that do conserve resources <laughs> they have to because <laughs> you know. yeah. do, do you think it's possible for for GM, GMOs to foster life do you think genetic modification could, could be good in the long run I mean I mean it, it's I think it's kind of ridiculous to even ponder if it will or will not um, I just basically leave it up to the people to decide you know if they want it they're gonna sub they're gonna they're gonna support it they're gonna buy it right if if it if it ends up let's say let's say you know government dissolves right and uh, you know <laughs> spontaneously and um, and there is no more government subsidies or protectionism um, if these if these uh, you know if these genetically modified foods are found to be indeed carcinogenic and basically just you know destroy life and you know cause genetic mutations in offspring then you know it's going to be obvious what's going to happen right mm -hmm. so um i don't even yeah i i don't think that um it's even necessary to think about like what would happen or should i you know should it be should it exist or should it not exist it's like it will take care of itself <laughs> you know uh i like i like i like george carlin's like uh, george carlin's uh, view about uh you know, uh, environmentalism, you know, it's like, basically, it's so ridiculous how we, we try to, you know, save the whale, save the snail, save the bee, save the, all this stuff, right? <laughs> because, you know, because humans have caused global warming, right? And we are the evil of, of the earth, and we, you know, we've caused the extinction of so many species. But, you know, look at how many species have already been extinct. 99.9% .9 of species already extinct. That had nothing to do with humans, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I don't know. Absolutely. So, so yeah, that's, so, that's, that's that's so true. That's so true. I think that's the way. I I uh, I'm I'm kind of uh, I I think um, messing with genetics is is it's it's definitely going to become more and more prevalent, and advance more and more and more. And I have high hopes that just like any other technology, eventually it's going to make life better. But uh, yeah, again, I don't know when the market the marketplace will handle it. You talk about George Carlin. I'm a big fan of fan of comedy myself. You talk about your brother who likes comedy a lot too. Uh, who like? I mean, my favorite comedian is probably Doug Stanhope. Like, obviously, because you know he's he's pretty pretty liberty minded guy. Yeah. Um. What What are some other comedians that you're into? Yeah, like Doug Stanhope, like um, Bill Burr is actually a little bit liberty minded. Um, he speaks his mind pretty pretty well. Uh, Cat Williams yeah. occasionally. Um, and then there's um, yeah, so you have George Carlin and then Bill Hicks. Bill Hicks is really awesome. In terms of liberty, mm -hmm. you know, he's uh, kind of unfortunately he died so young, 32 years old. I think he died. Um, but there's not there's not many though, you know, you know, liberty. And also there's this guy Steve Hughes. He, he, he's a he's pretty awesome. Yeah, he's, he's a British British comedian. Um, but yeah, there's not not too many. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna write. 
Yeah, I'll I'll give you the um, you know I'll give you these names uh, afterwards. I'll you know definitely uh, send you some yeah. videos. That's there's some awesome people. You know, yeah. you know if you yeah. can spread spread liberty and whatever whatever is your profession, whatever you know thing that you're uh, skilled at, you know, <laughs> all the better, right? So and, and if you can laugh while doing it, it makes it a lot better. Oh, definitely. <laughs> that's oh yeah. That's that, that's that's the way I prefer to spread my message is through laughter. You know, if yeah. you, because I, it's, it reminds me of a great Oscar Wilde quote. He said, uh, "You know, if you want to, if you want to sh share some truth, make make the people laugh, or else they're going to kill you." <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, that's probably wise. Yeah, that's, that's definitely <laughs> wise. I like that. I like that a lot. It's, it's, it, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Humor is is very important. Oh yeah. So so important. So, you know, that's that's my goal. Whenever I'm talking to people about this stuff, you know, it's so important to get people to laugh because you automatically have broken down the barriers. And they're not defensive anymore, and they're more receptive and open to your ideas. So, yeah, completely, completely. Speaking to people's interests is always is always the way to go. Yeah, yeah, especially when you're, when you're talking about you know economics and and stuff that's kind of kind of hard to digest. You have to you have to put it in in fun ways and make make fun metaphors and. And they say when you like when you're giving a speech or something, you should you you need to laugh every thirty seconds or sixty seconds or something. Oh yeah, and to, to to maintain people's interest. Or, um, oh, yeah. Oh, you mean you mean if you can get the audience to laugh? Yeah. 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 yeah definitely. Definitely. I reckon. I, oh yeah. Comedy. You know. I yeah. I used to do stand up comedy for like a year. And, oh, uh, really? oh really? Yeah. Yeah. I did it for about a year. Like uh, performed in uh, you know Manhattan, a couple of clubs there, and some clubs in Long Island, and it really helps. Um, you know, uh, you know, public speaking is something that's so um, deficient in so many people. <laughs> I talk to people, you know, and uh, everybody says that. You know, I can't do comedy because I'm a horrible public speaker. Um, but you know what? Who who is not? Everybody, everybody is a horrible public speaker. You know, <laughs> it's a skill that you have to develop. You know, um, and I saw. I remember seeing a poll that said, "What what are the what what is the thing that people are most afraid of?" Right, and number one is public speaking. Number two is death. Oh, really? Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So. There's a scientific method for that poll. Did they just ask people and they said they said public speaking more often than they said death? I don't know, but I remember. That's <laughs> what I remember, and uh, and it really it really uh, caught my interest because yeah, it is it is a very um, you know it's, it's it's primary thing in people's minds. Like I can't do that. You know, that's not for me. You know, I'm not funny. I'm not a funny person. So it's something that everybody can develop, and it just enhances your communication skills. How you can deliver a message, right? So. Yeah, it's, 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 it's just another way, but um, but yeah, I don't want to keep you too long. So um, so so let people know how they can reach you. You know, any websites or Facebook page or anything like that. Sure, sure. Uh, the best the best way to, to follow me on Courage just to uh, follow me on Twitter. It's uh, at M A M O N one L H. That's Mamo and and the letter N, the number one, the letter L, the letter H. And that stands for No One Leaves Hungry, which is kind of my rap conglomerate that that I. That I was part of, um, and then, yeah, find me on Facebook. I'd love to talk about stuff and you know keep the ideas going. I just make some more on Facebook. Any any uh, YouTube and, channels? You know, there's links to all my other social media through there. You can find me on YouTube. You can search me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, my Google Plus is just make some more, and my YouTube channel is make some more. Got music videos on there, all that stuff. So yeah, check it out, share it, download it, steal it, claim it your own, do whatever. <laughs> awesome. Okay. No IP, right? No IP. No IP whatsoever. <laughs> steal it. Record it and claim it your own. It's yeah. all good. All good. Um, yeah, and, and uh, if you want to finish off with a message, uh, any, any message you want to give to the listeners before we go? Uh. Understand that most most people, you know, ninety eight percent of the population are not psychopaths, and they really just want what's best, and they want to be happy. So just have empathy when you're talking to people about ideas, and, and be gentle when talking to them, and speak to their interests, and you know, promote the ideas of liberty because it'll make the world a better place. Nice. Yep, I completely agree. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks Very cool, so much, Mason. Thanks for the opportunity. So this Thank is you. no problem. This is peaceful anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Conscious Resistance. Uh, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. <laughs>